Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today is uh, lecture 8 of our course on Maxwell equations and electromagnetic waves. Uh, this uh, video was due, this lecture was due yesterday, but yesterday I was a bit uh, busy with the quiz, with grading the quiz, um, so I couldn't put this video up on time. So I'm uh, putting this up today. Uh, so this is lecture 8, and the agenda for the lecture is as follows. First, we will recap what we learned in um, section uh, in lecture 7, and uh, that is a recap of Maxwell's equations in vacuum. Uh, we will look at the potential formulation and gauge freedom. I feel we did this in a bit of a hurry, so we will go over this again. Hopefully, second time things will become a bit more. Um, um, the things will look start looking a bit more familiar and um, easier to understand. And then um, I'm going to talk about something which I ignored in the magnetostatic section of the course, which was magnetic fields in media. Um, today we will just address that. And this will see that it will lead to the introduction of a new variable, just like when we discussed electric field in media, we had to introduce a new um, a quantity, which was the electric displacement. Uh, in case of magnetostatics, um, we will need to introduce a new entity as well, which is the magnetic field or magnetic uh, this is also called the magnetic field and B is usually regarded as the magnetic flux density. So H field, but I will use the word H field. Griffiths uses the curious terminology auxiliary field. It doesn't uh, sound so good. So I'm just going to use it. Uh, you call it the H field. So I feel uh, Richard Feynman's uh, terminology is the best, which he called this to be the magnetic field and B to be the flux density. So we will see that we need, we will need to invent this uh, new quantity and then um, this quantity will help us in rewriting Ampere's law for magnetostatics in a, a, a nicer package. And then I will uh, write down the Maxwell equations in matter, just like we did for uh, in the last lecture for Maxwell equations in vacuum. Also write down the associated boundary conditions. And then I'm going to um, talk about uh, energy conservation law for EM forces. And what we will show is that um, the existence of something which is known as a pointing vector. So pointing vector um, um, actually is the flux of energy in a given region of space where you have electric and magnetic field. So the direction, it says the energy escaping per unit uh, area per unit time in a given direction is given by the pointing vector. So um, this is very important because um, as I said, that uh, usually when you have electromagnetic forces, two charges which are moving will um, exert electromagnetic forces on each other and it became apparent that these two forces are not equal and opposite. So Newton's third law is violated when it comes to electromagnetic interactions and you must, or you might ask, um, what you learned from your high school, that how come this uh, doesn't obey Newton's third law because we know Newton's third law is intimately related to the second law and the conservation law of linear momentum. So no, either linear momentum is being violated or something else is going on. So the idea is that, yes, it, it is true that linear momentum is not being conserved. And the reason is that this, when we have interaction between two force, two um, charge, moving charges or two current elements, it's not exactly a two body problem. It's not that two two objects are participating in the interaction. There is a third object, which is the electromagnetic field. So it's actually a three-body interaction. And in three-body interaction, we do not have a third law. Third law applies to two individual. Um, so this electromagnetic field is taking away some part of the linear momentum. That's why when we count the total amount of linear momentum, the charges, that will never add up to zero. Uh, sorry, that will not be the entire thing. And part of it is being taken away by the electromagnetic field. So it's a three-body in fact, uh, people call it a many-body system. That that's why you don't have a third law and energy and uh, or momentum conservation when you have interaction between two point charges or two current elements, um, because there is a third player in the situation, which is the EM field, which is taking away part of the energy and momentum. So we will discuss um, this. That overall linear momentum is conserved. If you count everything, if you count the linear momentum of the charges and if you count the linear momentum contained in the fields, then everything is conserved. Total linear momentum is conserved. 
and this will uh, we will uh, in the process of doing that we will come across a quantity um, which is known as the Maxwell stress tensor this you can think of uh, is uh, it's a tensor object but uh, you know by the name indicates the tensor object now um, the idea is that you can think of the stress tensor the word stress most of you know is uh, something which means force per unit area um, per force per unit area right stress and then if you have normal stress that is the, if the force is normal to the unit area which is meant then we call it pressure and when you have tangential stress per unit area then that is called shear so uh, what it happens is then uh, if you have a distribution of charges um, various parts of the distribution exert forces on each other and as a result the whole distribution experiences a kind of stress or some pressure or strain or um, I mean sorry a shear so those are all those are con uh, contained in the components of the Maxwell stress tensor okay so we will uh, see this quantity uh, the formulas are not, not very clean or elegant but still uh, we will uh, uh, you know try to ignore the messy formula and overall get the central message uh, Okay, and then I didn't have it. We will also talk a little bit of one one line about angular momentum as well. So uh, it will turn out that uh, even angular momentum is not conserved and electromagnetic fields will contain elect um, angular momentum as well. So um, the references for this are Griffiths and this is complementary to the last select lecture when the references were chapters 5 and 7. The material here you can find in chapter 6 and chapter 8. Okay. Okay, so let's do a recap of the, um, you know, tail end of yesterday's class where we introduced the four maximum equations and these are the four maximum equations I have it in a box for your convenience. The first one um, is the one which goes unchanged from unmodified from electrostatics which is uh, measuring the divergence of E. The divergence of E is proportional to the charge density and there's some constant which is an artifact of choosing ugly units. And then we had the um, curl of E vanishing law in electrostatic. We had to be modified for um, non-static or dynamical situations when they have time fluctuating magnetic fields. If you have time fluctuating magnetic fields, then the curl E equal to zero law changes to something else, which is known as Faraday Lenz's law. After it's people who um, you know formulated this. And then of course in magnetostatics we had divergence of B equal to zero. This law also goes through in the full theory, in the full dynamical theory. And the physical interpretation is that magnetic field lines do not have a beginning and an end. They are closed loops. Uh, so with, even without any sources, they can hang around in space, uh, just as you leave a simple loop out in space. That's why in cosmology you have um, magnetic fields throughout the universe, which do not need any sources. Uh, and then... Um, the final one, which was uh, which was uh, arrived at by Maxwell, based uh, a modification of the Ampere's law, which was curl of B equal to mu naught J, but that was not compatible with the continuity equation and charge conservation. So Maxwell modified in a way by adding this uh, quantity in the equation, introducing this quantity, which he called displacement current, and it will become clear in today's class why he called this a displacement current. And once you do this, this equation becomes compatible with uh, charge conservation, and these four equations are, um, you know, pretty good. Uh, the final version, which is like, you know, uh, entire electrodynamics in a box. These four laws govern every kind of phenomena. As you know, most of the uh, phenomena in the universe is electromagnetic. Most of the large-scale phenomena we see. And so these four equations are, in, uh, you know, are governing everything, most of it. So I also made a comment that how many equations are there? There are, this is a scalar equation, this is a scalar equation, so one component, one component. This is a vector equation, so there are three components, and this is also a vector equation. So the divergence equations are scalar equations, while the curl equations, equations two and four, are vector equations. So there are total num eight, two vector and two scalar, so total eight. However, we know the number of variables is six because E has three components and B has three components. So there is an apparent mismatch and I had asked you guys to think about why there is this mismatch and uh, I hope some of you have thought about it or at least um, 
looked up the book and seen what the solution is. So the solution is that, uh, the resolution is that, well, it is true that there are eight equations, but the curl equations are not three equations each, but instead two equations each. The reason is that um, components of a curl, the three components of a curl are not independent. From the x component and the y component of the curl, if you add and subtract or add or subtract them, you can get the third component of the curl. So these are not three independent equations. There are there, the third equation can be um, arrived at from the first two equations, okay? Because the components of the curl are not really independent quantities. So any equation which contains a curl, it will not be zero, okay? So the number of independent equation here is two, so uh, two each. So two into two, that's uh, four, and then two, six. Now we have six independent equations and six variables E and B. So now that makes sense. Uh, I also made a comment that the first and the last one, these equations are kind of equations of motion because um, there is a cause and the effect on both sides. On the right hand side you have a cause and the left hand side you have an effect or the field it produces, the source produces. So um, this is why it's a real equation of motion. It tells you given rho and j what kind of E and B am I supposed to produce. Uh, while these second and third equation, these two equations do not have rho or j on the right hand side. So it doesn't care about which uh, configuration of charges it's producing. For any configuration, these two of sources uh, or charges or currents, this should equation be two. This should equation should be true. So these are like constraints or consistency conditions on the theory. And these go by the name of Bianchi identity. So they are constraints that must hold for all valid solutions of the equation of motion okay if you find some solution which doesn't obey equations two and three then it is not a good solution okay and then we also looked at the potential version of maxwell equations so um because curl of e is non-zero e is not equal to minus gradient of phi simply we saw in the lecture that e is now given by minus uh, gradient of phi minus uh, del A del T where A is the magnetic vector potential and B as usual because divergence of B is zero we can, we can still write it as curl of a uh, vector potential magnetic, magnetic vector potential so the, these are the general definition of potential or field in terms of the potential E gets modified by this term okay so uh, this we obtain by solving equations 2 and 3 so from 3 the solution was that B equals curl of A and we plugged in equation two and we got this uh, this equation, right? So two and three have been taken care of. And we can plug the E and B in these expressions in terms of the potential. So you can see that E and B are both given by space and time derivatives of the potential, okay? Spatial derivative, time derivative. So now we can plug these in equations one and four, right? Two and three has been taken care of. If we plug in one and four, we get the potential version of Maxwell's equation which do look a bit nasty. Um, so you have some kind of a second order equation, uh, differential equation, second order partial differential equation. This um, this is a mixed space and time derivative. One is a scalar equation, the other is a vector equation. As you can see on both sides, A is a vector. This is a scalar operator, and then vector acting on a scalar. And the right hand side is also a vector. So this is a nice. So this uh, potential version also seemingly, um, to some people it might look uglier than the these equations which we had before, the field ver version, field strength version of Maxwell equation. The, uh, for me it looks better or many people would find it more aesthetically pleasing because you have no ambiguity in the number of equations is four, the number of variable is four, one for phi and three for the components of the magnetic potential. And the sources are also four in number. So rho is one component and j has three components. So it's aesthetically very pleasing. The number of sources or cause of electromagnetism, rho, which are rho and j, and the effect which are produced, which is the fields phi and a, they are the same, all of them are four. And it's also symmetric in the number of variables and the number of equations, okay? So although it looks a bit ugly um, compared to, uh, look a bit uh, complicated compared to this this form of Maxwell's equation, the field strength version of Maxwell's equations, in many respects, it's actually much more pleasing. And if you, uh, in fact, these equations will simplify. This is not the final word. 
This is, of course, a more general situation, but we will see that uh, we can simplify the look of these equations a little bit. And for that, we had to um, realize that there is a kind of ambiguity in the definition of the potential, which is called gauge freedom or gauge ambiguity or gauge symmetry. It's not really a symmetry. It's more about, as I said, it's an ambiguity, a redundancy in description. There are too many descriptions of the same thing. <coughs> Sorry. So if I change the definition of the um, vector potential by um, some gradient of an arbitrary scalar, so this is arbitrary, that's what I'm, chi is an arbitrary function of space and time, and we also change the definition of phi to phi prime, which is given by this. Now in terms of A prime and phi prime, we can compute the electric and magnetic fields. So if you compute the magnetic field, which is curl of A, because curl of divergence vanishes, so curl of a gradient vanishes, we see that the curl of A and A prime are the same and both of them give you B. Similarly, if we have these uh, new phi prime and A prime, the new potentials, if we plug in the formula for the electric field, we see that they re also reproduce the old electric field. So although the potential change to phi, uh, phi going to phi prime and A going to A prime, the physical quantities which we measure in the lab, which is that the E and B field, they are unchanged. So for the same, uh, uh, you know, same uh, physics, we have multiple descriptions. So this is a redundancy of description, which is known as gauge freedom. Uh, you might think it is a bit confusing because chi is completely arbitrary and it seems like there are infinite number of uh, A and uh, in infinite number of different potentials which describe the same E and B field. It is true. However, we can use, this is not confusing. In fact, it is a good thing because it lets, leads to simplification of a lot of expressions. Um, for example, we can choose uh, out of all possibilities, we can choose a subclass of possibilities in which we keep on changing, keep on uh, redefining using chi's such that the new A and phi, new vector potential and scalar potential, which are obtained from the old ones by the, these uh, additions, these uh, um, spatial derivative of or the gradient of chi and time derivative of chi, such that the final uh, final potential which we arrive at um, satisfies this kind of an equation. Okay, so one over c squared is just for dimensional reasons because uh, phi has a has dimension phi over c, and then uh, deriv spatial derivative has to have one over spatial derivative, so one over c dt. Okay, so um, we keep on changing this so such that we arrive at some. A and phi which obeys this condition which is known as Lorentz gauge okay so if you have a Lorentz gauge why do we want to do this because we can see some parts of the equation go to zero when we apply use this Lorentz gauge condition when if this is zero so if we use Lorentz gauge uh, which means when potential is not completely arbitrary now it is restricted in the sense that it has to obey this equation then the Maxwell equation simplify and this is written in blue equation and it looks even more symmetric it is the same operator acting on phi giving you the charge density this operator acting on vector potential giving you the current density okay so this operator um, which is del square Laplacian minus the second derivative in time this uh, combination is sometimes known as the D'Alembertian or the wave operator and it's denoted by this box so later on, I will just write box of phi, box of a. Okay. Okay. So this is about this is where we end the summary or, or recap of our last lecture. Now we want to do something as I said, which we ignored um, in the previous lecture, which is looking at magnetic fields in medium, uh, magnetostatic fields in particular, not arbitrary, um, magnetostatic fields in medium. For that, just as we did for the electrical uh, case, we need to know a little bit about magnetic dipoles. So, uh, but we do not have magnetic monopoles. We, we uh, sure, sure, from the divergence B equal to zero, it tells you that there are no magnetic poles, otherwise curl of B would not be zero. In fact, there is a subtle, uh, subtle violation of that statement, but nonetheless, for all practical purposes, we will say that there are no magnetic monopoles around so there are no sources so what I mean by a magnetic dipole in that case unlike an electric dipole where you have a positive and negative charge um, separated um, by some distance that is not the picture of a magnetic dipole what we mean by a magnetic dipole is a current carrying loop okay. imagine let me just go to yeah 
So imagine you have some loop, small loop which is uh, carrying some current. The direction of the arrow gives you the direction of the current. Okay, such a um, such a current carrying loop, uh, you can subject it to a magnetic field, and the force on that we already know is determined by the Lorentz force law. I dx, which is the current element times crossed with B, gives you the force. Now. Uh, the total force is of course uh, the full integral over the loop i dx cross b is just on the element and then when you do the integral perform the loop integral over then uh, over this loop current loop uh, that gives you the total force now if b is uniform it goes out of uh, it goes out of the integral and then you have integral of d of x now that is zero because this is an exact differential and is you know closed integral closed loop integral of an exact differential is zero. Hopefully you have learned this in partial in your multivariable class. So if you put a magnetic dipole, uh, sorry, a current carrying loop in a uniform magnetic field, then the total force on it is zero. However, there is a non-vanishing torque acting on it. So um, a torque on the current carrying loop is non-vanishing. If it's a uniform field, we see that the force is vanishing, but the uh, uh, torque will not vanish. So torque is given by the force multiplied by R cross F and this F is I D X cross B, right? And then you integrate over the whole loop to get the total torque. Now, um, uh, using some vector identities, you can process this a bit. And because B is uniform, you can bring it out of the integral, right? You can bring it out of the integral and then use vector identities to process this a little bit using the because there is a triple product it will simplify and what you should get that this is equal to m cross b where m this quantity is given by this current i over 2 integral of x cross dx so x is the location of the element and dx is the line element uh, along the tangent vector a little you can think of a small arrow along the uh, let me just go back to the picture for a second yeah, you can think of, uh, I should have had a diagram here, a small amount of, uh, uh, a tiny amount of a line segment of the loop here. And X is, of course, with respect to some origin, the location of that uh, current element. So then most of you can recognize uh, this half of, if you leave out the I a little bit, half of this X cross DX gives you the area of the loop or the triangle uh, you know, this is the in cross product in vector algebra gives you the area of the parallelogram bound, bound by these two x and dx. And the half of that will just give you the, you know, um, half of that parallelogram, which is the triangle area. So this quantity with the half x cross dx will turn i times, will become i times the area of the loop, actually. So we had this loop here, so it will give you the area of the loop with the direction of the current determining the direction of the normal. Um, if it's anticlockwise, then it is positive upwards. Um, so um, the torque on this uh, for current carrying loop can be shown to be m cross b, where m is this quantity i times the area, known as the magnetic dipole moment. So this is the idea of a dipole loop. In uh, magnetostatics, it is not. Uh, it is completely unlike what you had in electrostatics, which we had unlike charges of equal magnitude separated by a uh, certain distance. Um, then you can also compute the potential energy in a uniform field. Now, to do this, you, can, you have to do a little bit of a trick. First, you have to assume uh, B is not uniform, right? B is not uniform. In that case, this closed integral. Uh, will not vanish because you cannot take b out of uh, the integral because b depends on x. Now you have such a non-uniform field, uh, force fi uh, fi magnetic field, and then the force is given by the Lorentz force law. Now you can, because magnetic field is a conservative force, you should be able to write, as you have learned in classical mechanics, as minus gradient of the potential energy, right? And if we equate these ex expressions, you can read off what u is. So u will turn out to be minus m dot b. Uh, remember now we've taken b to be, for the time being temporarily, we have taken b to be um, uh, space time, uh, spatially non-homogeneous. So it's varying in space. It's non-uniform. 
uh, and we arrived at this formula but then this formula special will also work for the special case when b is uniform because we derived it in the general circumstances um, so u equals minus m dot e so equate these two equate these two expression and from that read of u that will be equal to this and then you take the special case when b is a constant or uniform so this is the potential energy of a dipole um, so uh, I want to draw your attention to the fact that some of you might have studied this in high school but the electric dipole similar things electric dipole also has a torque experiences the torque when it's uh, placed inside an electric field which is given by P cross E and the potential energy of an electric dipole placed in an electric field E is given by this expression so these are very analogous looking expression look at the potential energy and the torque if you just replace the m's by the p's or vice versa if you start with this p um, by m you get these uh, so this is the torque experienced by a current carrying loop and the potential energy of a current a tiny current carrying loop inside a magnetic field so a current carrying loop is our definition of a magnetic dipole you can also compute the vector potential to a, for a current loop um, this I will leave as a homework. Uh, it'll, I'll put it in assignment three. Um, verify that the vector potential produced by a loop is this. Okay. This is the expression which is very important, which um, has it is proportional to um, the. Let's say the loop is very small, just as in the ideal dipole, electric dipole. We consider the ideal dipole or point dipole in which the unlike charges are brought closer together, but the magnitude of their um, um, separation, I'm sorry, magnitude of the charges is uh, taken to infinity so that the product remains finite, so the P is finite. Similarly, we can do a similar procedure for M. We can um, we can make this I grow very large but then the area becomes very small so that it's almost a point object and but the product remains finite so if that is the case we have an ideal magnetic dipole as well now ideal magnetic dipole the vector potential due to that is given by this and I've written verified means what you have to do is to check if this is true is you have to take a curl of this okay you take a curl of this and then you can check it indeed produces the magnetic field um, due to a dipole remember magnetic field due to a dipole can be computed from the Biot-Savart law by assuming that the dipole is a current carrying loop and taking uh, you know the dipole limit in which the area of the dipole goes to zero but the current goes to very infinity so that the product remains the same okay so this is the expression which we will be using um, and the reason we are studying this is because material media um, by themselves or um, when placed in a magnetic field will develop such a magnetic moment by which I mean atoms contain electrons moving around in orbits so these, these are like tiny electrical dipoles also um, electrons contain something which is known as an intrinsic spin which is the magnetic moment uh, without any notion of a current going around it it's uh, ideally a point object the electron is a point object so uh, inside the electron we don't imagine things moving around but the electrons uh, the electron itself has an intrinsic dipole moment magnetic dipole moment so um, in a sense the magnetic uh, any media material media is already made of a tiny number of atomic dipoles atomic uh, current loops in which the electrons are going around in orbits and the electron itself contains spin similarly the nucleus of atoms also contain nuclear spins so each of these spins have a magnetic moment uh, so uh, it's full of dipoles magnetic dipoles and as a result when you place such a material in a magnetic field they can undergo a certain number of uh, uh, processes in which uh, which gives rise to different phenomena 
known as diamagnetism, paramagnetism, and ferromagnetism. There are some more which I have not bothered writing about. These are the principal three main uh, kind of material. First one in which uh, the atoms or the molecules do not have a net dipole moment. Okay, so the atomic orbitals either they have opposing el electrons going around in orbits in opposing directions or they have equal number of oppositely spinning electron, opposite spin electrons. The total net dipole moment of each atom or constituent I, uh, molecule is zero. Okay, so such kind of a material which we will call usual diamagnet what happens when you introduce a magnetic field inside that kind of a material or you place the material in a magnetic field then these magnetic um, these material which had its atoms which had zero magnetic moment will now develop magnetic moments so these will develop magnetic moments when placed in the magnetic field if you remove that the magnetic moments will again disappear um, as you can imagine this is an induced magnetic moment and Lenz's law says that any kind of induced magnetization will oppose or weaken the original magnetic field just as we had for dielectrics dielectrics polarize the dielectrics get polarized when you subject it to an electric field and the polarization opposes the original uh, electric field so that's why um, the electric field will diminish inside that's why you know in high school you have learned that the coulomb force law inside a dielectric uh, uh, is weaker than the uh, one in vacuum because of the dielectric uh, kind of polarized gets polarized uh, in the presence of an electric field and that polarization actually opposes the original um, electric field will cause the polarization so similarly diamagnetic is such as an object they are magnetically uh, they have zero dipole moment at the beginning uh, when there's no uh, magnetic field around and if you place them in a magnetic field they will develop tiny magnetic moments and those moments are actually um, those will they will oppose the effect of that will be opposing the original magnetic field okay however this is not the only behavior uh, there are material which do not have uh, which have um, magnetic moment in them and you know even without magnetic field just because they said material in which um, all molecules or atoms contain electrons moving around in orbits around the nucleus these orbital uh, electron loops have a magnetic moment also the nucleus and the electrons have some spin that also contributes to a magnetic moment so they might not add up to all zero right in the most general situation generic situation is the second one paramagnetic in which they do not add up to zero so already have some magnetic moments an external magnetic field as I said these are very tiny so you can assume that the external magnetic field is not uh, changing appreciably over this tiny loop so it's an effectively a constant uh, B magnetic moment in a constant B we know uh, magnetic dipole in a constant B it doesn't experience much force but it will experience a torque in fact this torque um, again magnetic external magnetic field applies a torque on the atomic loops or magnets and it lines up along the external field this torque will is proportional to m cross b so this will be zero when m and b are parallel so if you imagine the whole material to maybe of such, such tiny loops and you can see this is the mag mag magnetic dipole moment direction in the interior of the loop or in here in this region the magnetic field also is in this direction so the magnetic field as well as uh, the induced magnetic field uh, due to the dipoles falling in line with the magnetic field with the external magnetic field um, all of them are in the same direction so it strengthens the original B field okay it will strengthen the original B field you can think of the whole material as made up of a tiny dipole and each one falling in line with B and thus increasing the strength of B so um, usually such things are um, this this um, lining up and uh, the induced magnetic field is small is weak however when uh, there are materials in which the magnetization um, creates magnetic field which is thousand times larger than the original field so this the field here will be much larger vector compared to this B externally applied field 
in that case we cannot use the weak field approximation anymore and that is a whole different class of phenomena which is known as a ferromagnetism in which of course as you can imagine if it's thousand times larger we might not as well bother about the external magnetic field that is true so ferromagnets uh, display such kind of magnetization even when the original source uh, is removed it produces things known as hysteresis loops most of you have learned this in middle school or high school at some point but uh, you know this is a one fractal course so we're not going to uh, spend much time on diamagnetic material or ferromagnetic material uh, Griffiths has a very nice uh, kind of demonstration as to how this thing happens in terms of atomic uh, atomic orbital uh, electron loops and he shows how exactly um, this uh, orbital loops are affected so that the uh, it ends up creating a magnetic field in the opposite direction to the applied uh, ferromagnet stuff also I will not to say anything else anything more this is the only slide where I have these two objects as I said the host I'm uh, sorry the most of um, Magnetic substances will fall under the heading of paramagnets, paramagnets, and uh, we will only exclusively discuss this. Okay, and these are the objects, as I said, which in which you have the realignment of the molecular magnets in a way, such that the original B field gets strengthened by a certain amount. So we'll look at paramagnetic materials, and we'll see that this will, uh, this aligning will, this will lead to an existence of something known as bound charges bound currents I'm sorry just as the electric um, polarization led to um, the uh, concept of bound charges so it has this object paramagnet will have a magnetic moment per unit volume big M and the vector potential for this would be the sum over all so integral of d cube x prime m x prime gives you a little magnetic dipole sitting at this location x prime and this crossed with that will give you the magnetic uh, potent vector potential due to a single due to a single infinitesimal amount infinitesimal dipole and then when you integrate you get the full vector potential due to the entire um, entire paramagnetic slab so this is the full expression if you remember the vector potential is given by this and all i did is mx prime i substituted by integral d cube times the density volume times density will give you the total magnetic moment in the infinitesimal volume and then i also put an integral so that uh, i get the total vector potential now um, this guy we can again using vector identities we can this is divergence of one over x x over x is cube mod x cube is equal to divergence of one over x and then we do integration by parts in which we take this outside um, and we also have another term which is given by this so integration by parts will have a whole total derivative when del is outside both m and 1 over x and then there's another term in which the gradient will act on just m so gradient uh, or this del operator not gradient but del operator will act on m so again i i will ask you to verify that this is the case if you are having difficulty try to do component by component this is vector quantity these two are also vector quantities try to do component by component so this curl of something so you have two terms one is as i said the when the nabla is outside both of them so it's a whole derivative now using stokes theorem we can convert this curl over volume i'm sorry not stokes theorem using gauss divergence theorem although it's a curl uh, if you look at the homework so I've given one example in which you have a curl theorem for volumes as well which is which can be derived uh, cleverly by, from the Gauss divergence theorem if you do that you can show that this will become n cross m cross n divided by this so it's a surface term using Gauss divergence theorem and then this guy we will keep as it is so it looks like uh, the vector potential due to some current divided by x so just as we had scalar if you imagine instead of a, a scalar potential scalar potential has charge divided by 1 over x x minus x prime 1 mod this this quantity the distance between the source and the field the vector potential is also similar so instead of the charge you have the current okay so you have the current I don't know why there's a dot here. Maybe this is a typo. Yeah, you shouldn't. Don't 
think anything about this dot. It's not a dot product of this and this. This is a scalar quantity, so you can never have a dot product between these two quantities. Um, so 1 over x, then the numerator must be some kind of charge density. So in this case, because it's a surface integral, this must be a surface charge density, and this is a volume integral. Oh, sorry, not current charge density, this is a current density, and because we're talking about the vector potential. And the volume integral, this must be a volume current density, J bound. So this is indicated in green. So this magnetization, the magnetic uh, effect of that, the effect of that is identical if we, instead of having a magnetized magnetic dipole moments, we have just a distribution of currents called K bound and J bound uh, in lieu of this. They will also produce the identical effect, okay? So we are replacing the, um, the paramagnet by a bunch of currents. They are fictitious, of course, uh, in real life we actually have the paramagnet, but all I'm saying is the analysis simplifies uh, be, uh, because uh, we are replacing the magnet by this. Mathematically, in the equations, they produce the same effect. So in some sense, they are identical. And Griffiths, um, I think in chapter 7, uh, gives a justification of why physically this should be same, that they are, he considered such tiny current loops and those tiny current loops effectively um, he, he thinks of um, dividing the whole paramagnet into tiny current loops which are, are current blocks and then he adds up the total m cross n from each block and he shows that this uh, internal lines uh, the contribution from adjacent blocks cancel and what remains is the contribution from the surface outermost loops uh, so uh, that's how you can think of this bound current, uh, surface current and volume bound current. So please look at that. I'm just going to assume that we are going to replace the M by these pair of um, surface current density and volume current density. So uh, let's write down Ampere's law. Now Ampere's law should be the full thing. So curl of B should be mu naught times total J total current density. Part of it is current density which we are pushing in the, inside the paramagnet by hooking it up to a circuit. And the part of it is due to magnetization which is effectively some volume current density J bound, okay, which is given by this quantity curl of M. J bound is curl of M. So curl of M. Now this, uh, we have curl here both on the left hand side and right hand side. It makes sense to take this, transfer this to the other side. And then there's the mu naught, so don't forget about that. So if we do all that, we see that this equation can be rewritten as curl of something equal to J free, just this term. This quantity, 1 over mu naught B minus M, uh, on the left-hand side, which comes when you combine this term with this term, that is called this auxiliary field H, or magnetic field H. So we have Ampere's law in magnetostatics for in for a paramagnetic material given by this form curl of H equal to J free. Okay, it is not curl of uh, B equals mu naught J, but curl of H equal to, and there's no mu naught either because we have divided both sides with mu naught. Curl of H equal to J free. Now this is the nice equation because it is only the free charges which we control externally, and hence we can only determine H. Um, on the other hand, to determine B and, uh, you know, we can have to know about J bound, which means we have to know about the polar magnetization of the material, which is difficult to perform experimentally. We cannot just go inside and measure every location, what is M. Okay, so it's better wor to work with, um, work with things which we can control and uh, measure the effect of that, which is measured by H, okay? So this is the general M Ampere's law for magnetostatics in material media, in particular uh, paramagnetic media. Now we will uh, consider a special case. So we have too many unknown variables B and H. So to reduce, we will try to relate B and H in some way. Because at the end of the day, B H is made up of B and M. And M is created because M is there because you have an external magnetic field. Actually, M is there from before, but anyway. Uh, it lines up in the direction of the B, so in some sense M is governed by B. So uh, we will try to work with the situation in which 
uh, m is proportional to h this only happens when we have weak field that is b is weak m is magnetization is small so in that case m is a uh, you know you can expand in taylor m is the analytic function of h um, so um, every analytic fu function admits the taylor expansion and if the field is weak, we can restrict the Taylor expansion to the first two terms, which is a constant and this linear in H. The quadratic and others we will drop because H is small. Uh, in such an approximation for weak fields, we have a linear equation, M as a linear function of H. The zeroth order term goes away because when you take H equal to zero, there is no magnetization. So as I said that uh, paramagnetic objects can be thought of already have some magnetic mo moment but these magnetic moment or each atom has its magnetic dipole moment aligned in some arbitrary direction so the whole as a whole if you take a volume as a whole the magnetic magnetic dipole moment is zero because the each of the current loops are oriented in different directions now when you apply the h field or b field then they align with each other and of course, the stronger the field, the more with the magnetization. That's why it makes sense to take a linear relation. Although in all generality, you should consider more higher terms as well as you increase the edge. Now this chi m here is a tensor. That's why we have the center dot here. If you write in components, um, m i, ith component of m is equal to chi i j, h j. The j is the dummy index. So as I said, then in vector calculus lectures that when you have some tensor equation you should count the number of free indices on both sides and here it matches because i is the only free index on both sides now we can we will consider a further simplification which is not just linear but linear isotropic and homogeneous so isotropic means all the directions are same all the there is no direction bias in which case chi m i j will be proportional to delta i j the kronecker delta and homogeneous means this will be not a function of um, the location inside the dielectric. Throughout the dielectric this is the same. It, it is not a true in general, uh, but we will assume that for a large class of material it does happen that it is independent of the location in the dielectric. So in that case, this, is a const this will be replaced by some constant chi m times delta i j. This, now this chi m is not a tensor anymore. Maybe I should have used a better notation in which I would have made bold face. So this one is different. This one is the case when it's isotropic and chi m is uh, proportional to delta ij, Kronecker delta ij. In that case, uh, you have m parallel to h. In this case, here it was proportional, but not parallel because the ith component depends on the jth component. If it were parallel, ith component proportional to ith component of m of h, which happens in this case, okay, when it's isotropic as well as homogeneous in addition to being linear. So if that is the case, we can plug this in this equation for h and we find out that b is actually given by mu times h. This is the constitutive relation just like you have d equals uh, epsilon times e, where this mu is given by mu naught times 1 plus this number chi m, susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility. This number mu is sometimes known as the absolute permeability of the paramagnet. Uh, Uh, as you can see, because it's proportional to chi m, it uh, measures how strongly a um, uh, paramagnet gets uh, polarized. So it's some kind of measure of how, st how strongly a magnetic material gets polarized uh, when an external field is applied. What about boundary conditions? Now, boundary conditions for magnetic materials um, for the interf at the interface of two materials is given by two such uh, uh, Maxwell equations. The first Maxwell equation is the divergence of B equal to zero. Uh, divergence of B across the interface of two magnetic material with permeability mu1 and mu2. This is zero and this can be again seen from the Gaussian pillbox kind of argument. You consider a Gaussian pillbox which, um, which straddles, uh, located at the boundary which straddles both sides of the boundary and then uh, you consider Gauss divergence theorem applied to that and that should be equal to the right hand side is zero that will give you that the normal component of B um, over and under 
um, that is in the one side of the boundary, upper over upper side of the boundary and lower side of the boundary, the B is continuous. Normal component of B is continuous because this is zero. The other hand, the max Ampere's law tells you curl of H is J, H is J free. So curl of H is not zero. So that means the tangential component of H will not be continuous, right? We can use Stokes theorem to rectangular loop across the boundary. Um, so we have, again, we refer to the diagrams which I had in the earlier lecture, in lecture 7. We have some boundary and we have a rectangular loop uh, which is going across that boundary. Um, and then we compute this um, integral version of this, which is h dot dl and k free dot dl because the surface current which is threading through the loop, threading through the boundary. Um, Threading, I'm sorry, threading through the loop along the boundary. That's why it's a surface. Uh, this is just Ampere's law in integral version applied to a surface. And then this equation will lead to the discontinuity of the right hand side, will, left hand side will lead to the discontinuity of the uh, tangential component of H in terms of the surface current, surface free current, and the normal vector. normal. So the normal to the surface bounded, um, so there are two normals here. One, we have the rectangular surface in which we are going anti-clockwise. And that rectangular loop has a unit normal to that loop. That is one thing. And there is the n hat. This is another normal. This is normal vector with the boundary on the, from under to over. So we have some boundary and then the unit vector is orthogonal to the boundary. That is different from the surface norm, surface and uh, the normal to the surface of the loop, rectangular loop. So this is a vector equation because, um, as you know, the the boundary has two directions. It's a two-dimensional. If we live in three dimensions, so the boundary of any such thing would be a two-dimensional object. The two-dimensional uh, boundaries have two orthogonal two. We can resolve the vector in two directions. So that's why it's a vector equation. On the other hand, the normal component is a single component. That's why it's a scalar equation. Not a scalar, but a single component equation. This is two component, hence it's a vector equation. And you can show that this integral is given by this cross n. You might wonder where this n came from. The idea is that we have to consider the fact that there are two directions and then the you know, i comma j component will give you the kth component discontinuity. That's why we put a cross plot. Okay. What about the potential? Well, the potential um, also have some discontinuity, in particular this one. Um, but the potential itself is continuous, but the derivatives of the potential are discontinuous. Right? So the potential itself is um, continuous across the boundary. But the slope or the derivative of the potential, that is not going to be continuous. And this equation for linear isotropic homogeneous media can be written in this form. Right? I've just, all I've done is taken curl uh, cross product with respect to n hat on both sides. Okay, so if you're working with the potential formulation, these two should be your boundary condition. Because the Maxwell equation, the second order boundary equation, you should need two boundary conditions. One is the continuity of the potential and then the first derivative, uh, discontinuity of the first derivative, okay? So, uh, this is all we need to write down the four Maxwell equation for the material media. So, material media, now it can, it is both at simultaneously a dielectric as well as a paramagnetic or some magnetic material, any media has certain intrinsic uh, electrical properties and magnetic properties. So, in the generic case, um, Gauss law will be given by this because it's a material media. Curl all or the Faraday law remains as it is. Um, no sources of sinks law also remains. It doesn't change when you put uh, electromagnetic field in media or not. And finally, the what needs to change is the Ampere's law. This we discussed in the last lecture for vacuum. But it is also in the case of material media, you have to modify it. Otherwise, this will not be uh, consistent with the conservation for free charges. Now remember free charges are something which we put externally and they should be conserved on their own as if they should not mix up with bound charges. It's not that the sum total of free and bound charges is conserved. In fact, bound charges are fictitious quantities which we are used to uh, simplify calculations instead of working with the magnetization all the time. 
So free charges are conserved on their own and if you take a divergence of both sides, you will see that uh, due to this extra term which was not there in original Ampere's law and this extra term was added by Maxwell, you get back charge conservation. So divergence of both sides now at equal to zero can be shown to be zero compatible with uh, continuity equation for J free. Okay. So because uh, now the displacement current, this terminology becomes obvious. This term, extra term was added by Maxwell, remember. Um, so it's called a displacement current because A, it is proportional to the displacement vector. And also it has same dimensions as J free. Okay, del D, del T has dimensions of current and it's proportional to the displacement field. So that's why it's called displacement current. Uh, you can check that indeed this equation is consistent with charge conservation. Uh, conservation of free charges and hence is the correct uh, modification or correct equation. However, this uh, equations have too many unknowns. E is 3, D is 3, B is 3 different and then H is also different from B. In general, they will be different. So, there are 12 unknowns and we have just 8 equations uh, or 6 equations which are not enough. So we need to half the number of degrees of freedom and that we do that by relating D with E and H with B. So now D and D is the function of E, H is the function of B, then these two equations, sorry, these two equations become in terms of E and B, that is fine. Then we have six variables and six equations. So these equations are known as constitutive relations sometimes, a fancy name, or sometimes people call it the equation of state as well but I won't call it an equation of state because uh, the, the polarization as a function of E and magnetization as a function of B, that I would call an equation of state. But these are known as constitutive relations, okay? If you don't have constitutive relations, I don't think these form um, um, optimal set uh, which can be solved. Also, we have to, this is the first order differential equation, so we need to provide one boundary condition for each equation or of the same type. So if it's a scalar equation, you need to give a single boundary condition for a scalar boundary condition. And if it's a vector equation, you need to give a vector boundary condition. So these uh, I've already discussed before, H in particular for this. Um, you might wonder what happens, we just uh, gave this, but what about the del D del T term? Well, just as uh, this equation this in the Faraday law, the modification of del B del T electromagnetic induction, that did not change uh, the fact that curl of e, I mean the integral of E dot DL is zero uh, along the rectangular loop. This also will not cause any problem, and you'll get back the same one, even though the Mac original equation has changed, because this contribution which comes from the area of the loop will vanish as we take the rectangular loop to approach the boundary from both sides. So in that limit, this contribution vanishes. Just as it did for this term, we discussed this. Um, so we, these two have to be backed up by, uh, support, I'm sorry, supplemented by a set of boundary conditions, which I have not written because they are all there in the previous slides. So this is one question which I usually give in the exam to write down Maxwell equations the constitutive relation and the boundary conditions. So please, uh, this is a very important slide in a summary of half of our course is about this. So okay, so we, um, we will stop here in the sense that uh, we will go to a different topic now, which is uh, regarding conservation of energy. As I said, that we already have an open issue, uh, unresolved issue, the fact that uh, magnetic forces in particular are not equal in opposite direction between two charge elements or two moving charge element charge uh, elementary charges or um, current elements so we want to find out where this extra energy is uh, momentum or energy is going away and we already have a suspect that is the electric field electromagnetic field itself uh, we will see this here so uh, in order to keep track of what how, where the energy is going we first start with the work done on charges or currents by the electric and magnetic field, right? So this is the force on a charge. So this charge delta Q, infinitesimal amount of charge, is moving with the velocity V. And under, due to this force, it moves the distance dx. So then the work done is given by the force, Lorentz force, times dotted with the distance. And then, of course, uh, we have to do this 
actually this should be w the full distribution this was for infinitesimal and then the total the work done on the full distribution of charges is the integral of that so delta q is uh, i'm sorry why is this incomplete oh i'm sorry so this is delta q is integral of volume most of you know this delta q will be dq x times rho volume times volume charge density so we substituted a dq times rho and then we integrated so dq times rho here now um, dq times rho um, dq times rho but magnetic fields don't do any work because dx which is given by v dt and v cross b dot v dt is zero because v appears both inside the cross and outside in the dot so that is zero so the entire work is done by the electric field actually so e times d delta q which is integral of uh, d q times rho so integral d q rho e times dx but this dx is v dt and the rho and the v we will combine into the charge density i uh, sorry current density j j equals rho v okay so we have an expression for the work done on the distribution of charges and currents which is given by this expression Okay, volume integral of e dot j uh, times dt in an amount of small small amount of time dt later when we compute the rate of uh, work done we will take it to be under below this uh, we will take the rate dw dt okay and then we'll just have a clean expression e dot j uh, volume integral of e dot j so let's simplify this e dot j by using maxwell equation remember in Maxwell equations, let me just go back a bit. Uh, in Maxwell equation, the J can be written in terms of B and E, right? So this is what exactly we are going to do. Um, what I, this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to replace J by the uh, Maxwell Ampere law and then do a bunch of vector identities, which you can look up on Griffiths. I'm not going to go through them. They're pretty you know, straightforward. And then you can show that e dot j can be written as minus delta del t, so partial total, partial derivative, a time derivative of this quantity, which I'm calling u sub e m. And then, as you can, some of you can guess, this will become uh, electromagnetic field energy minus. Um, so this is the first order in time, and then there's a first order in spatial derivative minus. Because this is a scalar, we will have divergence of some vector. Um, this vector will s is given is something which we have learned in high school as pointing vector so e dot g is this expression we can plug it back here as i said i will take the, this dw down under this uh, dw sorry dt under this to compute the rate of work done the rate of work done will is this quantity e dot j but e dot j will have integral of this and then integral of that so integral of this quantity, volume integral of this quantity, when we plug it here, will give you, according to Gauss divergence theorem, some kind of surface integral. And because this volume integral extends to all space, this surface integral will be at infinity. Of course, this is just a volume term, rate of change of some volume term, where big, big UEM is volume integral of this quantity. Okay. Also, I've taken this, uh, so when we plug this here, so the time derivative was inside the integral, I have taken it outside. So most of you know the rule by now, partial time derivative will turn into a total time derivative when we do that. So this work done equation or the power equation, rate of work done on charges is given by some quantity here times this surface integral. Okay, but we also know from mechanics there is something called work energy theorem. If you do a bunch of work on a system of charges, it increases the kinetic energy, right? So the kinetic energy of the charges will increase because the electric magnetic electric field, non-magnetic field, field, magnetic fields do not do any work. Um, is doing some work on them that will increase their kinetic energy. So now we will equate these two expression. One from coming from mechanics, which is that the rate of change of work done is equal to rate of change of uh, rate of work done is equal to the rate of change of kinetic energy. And then from electrodynamics, we have this. When we equate these two, um, what we can see is that um, we can combine du kinetic and du electromagnetic into a single term, which we call u, the sum of these two. And then this term will give you 
this divergence piece. So we have a continuity like equation for energy. So this tells us that as this is in the continuity equation we have del rho del t plus divergence of j equal to zero. A rho is the density, volume density, and j is the current. Here also we have a similar equation. As I said, any conservation law at the end of the day is written in the form of continuity equation. Here, where instead of rho, we have u. So this is the energy density. Just as rho was the charge density, here we have the energy density. Then this must be the energy current density. Okay, S must play the same role as j, energy current density, which is the amount of energy uh, given per unit uh, area escaping normal to the area per unit time. So this is a slightly bigger font, so you can see things clearly. Well, U um, is the energy density of the charges and the energy density in the kinet electromagnetic field. So the total energy density in a given region of space where you have electromagnetic fields and charges is given by the energy that is contained in the kinetic energy of the charges and the energy contained in the fields. Where this is the expression. And the energy current or flux per unit time in given flu energy flux is energy per unit uh, area normal to the flow that is given by this s vector right pointing which is known as pointing vector and you can redo this calculation for media in which case you will find that this expression for the pointing vector is s, s equals e cross h instead of uh, e cross b over 1 over mu naught okay so energy conservation tells us uh, cons considerations of energy conservation tells us that okay it's not that the charge energy energy contained in the charges is not just conserved, the whole thing, the sum of energy of charges and the electromagnetic field, the whole thing is conserved. And um, so we should consider not, uh, you know, although the charges are for exerting forces on each other, they do not form a closed system by their own. We have to include the electromagnetic field, which is exchanging energy with them. So it's a many body problem, not a two body problem for which you have third law and all that. So, um, so this is the important expression to remember, this uh, pointing vector which gives you the flux of energy per unit time, normal to some area cross-sectional, you know, pro normal to the per unit area, normal to the flow. Similar, this was energy, we can do a similar um, consideration for uh, the momentum. So energy, rate of change of energy, instead of charting with uh, work done for momentum we will need to observe look at the force equation which is Newton's second law so we can compute the force on a charge distribution this is the Lorentz force and charge times uh, Q times E this is the Lorentz force law and then integral of that is the in total force on the full distribution so this is the force on a charge current distribution so this is written as a volume, so whatever is the integral integrand is the volume if the is the volume density. So little f is the volume density of the force, force per unit volume. Again we have j here and rho here. Rho and j we will eliminate using Maxwell equations, and we can write using Maxwell equations in this uh, bit nasty looking form. But again, I will not do the derivation here. You can look at the derivation up in Griffiths. So it consists of four terms. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, and 4. The third and the fourth term are something which are, we are already familiar with, which is the electromagnetic energy density, the gradient of that, and the rate of change of the finding vector, which is the energy flux per unit time. Apart from that, you have some contribution from these. So to simplify this uh, mess, we introduce something which is known as the Maxwell stress tensor, T sub ij. Right, this is the stress sensor, two to rank two tensor because it has two indices, and it is defined in this way. So then this expression simplifies a lot, in the sense this nasty guy can be written, four terms can be written as just two terms, which is divergence of t minus del s del t. So these three, all these three terms combine into a single term, divergence of t. You might object that divergence is only defined for a vector quantity and not a tensor quantity because T is the tensor here. What do you mean by divergence of that? What I mean is this. Th that's why I didn't write it a lower dot but a center dot. This means that you uh, contract the first index with the derivative. Okay. 
I'm sorry, this should be lower. I don't know why this is TIJ is upper. So this should be a subscript. Both of them should be subscript. IJ. So this equation becomes very compact. This nasty big term becomes very compact. And then we can plug it back here. Plug it back here. So this guy can be plugged back here. So the first term, which is the divergence, will become using divergence theorem some surface integral and the second guy will remain as it is except we can take the partial derivative out of the integral in which case it becomes a total derivative so we have this equation so which tells you the force uh, on a ch distribution of charges is something like that so this guy um, you can think of it as some kind of pressure because pressure is force per unit area this is area so if I divide look at the dimensions on both sides this guy is force per unit area t dot uh, n hat dot t right so n hat dot t in particular the diagonal components which is why it's called a stress tensor because you know stress is force per unit area um, stress tensor the diagonal component are the normal normal stress so you have a given direction i i when i and j are both the same that is t11 t22 t33 these are actually pressures, normal force per unit area. That is, the, given a, take a unit area on the surface of the conductor, surface not the conducting distribution, and then the normal force on that um, surface is the pressure, which is given by this, the diagonal components. And then the off diagonal components, 1, 2, or 2, 3, or 3, 1, these are shears, okay? These are um, tangential forces to the given unit area. So all these are packaged together in the single stress tensor and it is clear from here that force is area times some uh, stress and then there is of course a volume term which is not a surface term that is why this can be inter this cannot be interpreted as a stress because it is not force divided by area but force divided by volume so this is the force equation also we will use newton's second law in which force is equal to the rate of change of momentum of the charges because of forces are being acting on the charges so second law tells you that it will cause a rate of change of momentum of the charges so uh, this is equal to del p del t and then we will add these two terms because the both of them have del t del, del t on both so here you have del p del t using second law and there is a ddt here so i will take this on the left hand side and we can write this equation something like this so again this is in the form of a continuity equation del del rho del t plus divergence of j equal to zero except for del rho we have this uh, linear momentum density and instead of uh, j we have linear momentum current something like that so continuity equation remember one gives you the density the other gives you the term the divergence term gives you the current um, so uh, we see that the total momentum is not just of charges but also of the electromagnetic field so that is what I'm calling pi e and pi is the energy momentum density in the electromagnetic field the Greek letter for P this I'm using to denote the momentum density for the EM field and then T the stress tensor gives you the momentum current momentum flux per unit area per unit time so this let me just write this formula a bit slightly bigger so that you guys can see clearly what's going on so 1 over c square um, times s, the 1 over c square and then the s has a mu in it. So mu times c square will give you uh, 1 over epsilon naught, which is what we have here. So this is giving you the linear momentum stored in the field. This is why we didn't have Newton's third law valid, because um, uh, part of the force, uh, part of the momentum was being transferred away to the field, and that's why Newton's third law did not hold for two charges which are exerting magnetic forces on each other. Now, if there are no magnetic fields, for example, b equal to zero, this is this goes to zero. So, in the absence of magnetic uh, forces, we do do have a Newton's second law, valid because there is no momentum in the fields. Um, this is not true for the energy. If we even if we don't have magnetic field, we still have some energy in the electric field. But if we just have electric field and no magnetic field, the momentum will go to zero. Although it will have energy, it will not have momentum. You can repeat the same calculation for the media, and you can show that um, this sometimes I give in the exams. Um, this expression, you will not get this exact expression, instead, you'll get d cross b. Okay, 
d cross b instead of this expression yeah, this is what you obtain for a linear media linear isotropic homogeneous media now uh, you can also think about angular momentum what about angular momentum it turns out indeed the electromagnetic field also contains angular momentum so so far we've learned that the electric field contain electromagnetic fields contain this much of um, uh, energy per unit volume and it also stores some amount of linear momentum uh, which is given by the momentum linear momentum per unit volume of the electromagnetic field is given by this it also stores the angular momentum and you can easily find that out if you have location x uh, vector then the angular momentum at that location angular momentum density at that location is given by this quantity okay angular momentum density is position vector times linear momentum density okay so um, these are um, so gradually what we are realizing is that electromagnetic fields are the third major player uh, apart from charges and um, we will gradually shift our focus on EM fields in the next class almost they will become the main uh, player um, in the scheme of things and we will see how they actually transport energy and momentum through electromagnetic waves okay so we, uh, charges will not play any more roles here we will just talk about electromagnetic fields and radiation because they are the ones which produce the media of phenomena which we observe in nature okay so this is where we will stop talking about charges okay we'll catch up next time about waves electromagnetic waves thank you